times it comes that it's cheaper to drive than to use public transport. Or in some cases, of course, suburbs where you don't have a chest train transport, car is the most convenient and the cheapest, no doubt. But if you have 50,000 people coming from one quarry or into Central City, it's many times, of course, more expensive if they drive. So the picture is not complete here. The complete picture is that we have the additional costs. This is our owner, car owner cost. And this is various subsidies that are given. These are environmental costs and these are social costs. And social costs are costs of congestion. The fact that if I enter a very busy highway, I add delay to all the other cars, and they add to my delay. And that is always in our analysis of transportation and costs and city planning, we analyze that, the social costs of driving in the city. There are, of course, some social costs in public transport. There is some subsidy. There is some environmental cost, but usually much less than that, and some social cost and so on. So the whole total cost per passenger is much lower on public transport. But people decide on the basis of these costs above. That's one of the reasons that we have to subsidize transit, because if we had this in the fair, even more people would use cars because they decide only on the daily basis. And this is the reason why in many countries they try to reflect this cost on the daily basis. How would you transfer this cost up there? First of all, you should eliminate free parking, so-called free parking. And that is done in many companies in, in, uh, in the United States now, in California particularly. The, owner, the big factory, where most people come by car, they say, well, uh, they used to have free parking, and then the people complain because of this problem. And they developed a policy that we will give you now $100 a month for transportation. So if you drive your car, your parking and control and cleaning and police and so on cost us $100 a month, you give us back those $100. If you use bus or train, and you spend only $60, you can save $40 a month. If you save for two months and buy a bicycle, then after that, you will be earning $100 a month because you are not costing us. That's your total cost is reflected to uh, the way you travel. If you walk to the work, you again earn $100 a month. It really is absolutely logical and correct. Absolutely logical. Because this so-called free parking means others are paid. And if you have, I don't know if you have some stores, if you buy something, they'll give you free parking. Do you have some of that? Not much. I hope you don't get it. But they're using it to, to sell and so on. But you, you get sometimes, I don't know, 300 rubles forgotten because you are a customer, but if you pay 50 rubles for the bus, you don't get 50%, 50, 50 rubles back. So it's distributed subsidizing automobile at the expense of public transport. Another argument, yeah, next. Uh, no, 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 Then, benzin dojen bet dusher, but the much that I see up is with the exported, the best, uh, the tax of gasoline 
should not be high because of low income people. Well, it's important to have social concerns, but you cannot make something that is expensive just free to have for low income people. Because in that, on that basis, we would have to have many, many services lowered for everybody because some people cannot pay. So we should rather find other ways of assisting lower income people, but not use that argument not to have any taxes on gasoline. And this is, this is the reason, yeah, yeah. This is the reason, as I began to say, that many countries are trying to reflect this up here. How do we do that? That's the road pricing. That's the road pricing. Then we have sometimes insurance related to how many kilometers you have traveled. So any of these parking, road pricing, and insurance and so on, and, and taxes on gasoline are given in order to increase, to shift this up here and make it that the decision of drivers is more realistic rather than the drivers decide on this basis and have all these costs not think about it or some of these costs this cost is what we pay but this one is on others we impose on others the noise the congestion and so on but we don't consider that at all and that is the cost of our problem here, the whole problem of urban transportation, that we have this so called low cost parking, or low cost driving, which does not reflect the total costs. So, uh, the, we are going back to uh, the initial reaction to PROC. Uh, if we just say, well, we need to widen the roads and we need to provide more parking, uh, the basic question comes, is that correct or not? Well, it is correct that you have, we have to adjust the city considerably when we got the automobiles we have now public transport and automobiles and so on. We have to adjust and make the system much more efficient. However, we must be careful because cities which have just been widening the streets and providing more and more parking and so on have overbuilt and if you look at the, at the uh, high cost of free parking and so on, many cities are really destroyed by these policies if they were unlimited. There was a study recently in the city of Hartford, Connecticut, capital state of Connecticut, comparing that, that city in 1960s and today. They show that the number of parking is now three times greater than it was that the uh, number of businesses has decreased 40%, that the number of residents has decreased, they have moved to the suburbs. I mean, catastrophic results. And you see that what was done was just build more and more parking and so on. I know when I drive through Hartford, and there's a slogan there, stop and shop in Hartford. And all I see is concrete in all directions. I don't even see a city which would attract me to stop. It's just the concrete ways of going through Hartford. So that's the problem. And that's where we have to consider if we have congestion and such problems, how do we adjust and how do we, uh, how do we prevent the cities to be destroyed. Um, 
the uh, experiences have shown that uh, in, in uh, uh, developing countries the problems are very serious in, in cities. In, uh, in uh, Western Europe, several countries have many cities which have achieved intermodal transportation and prevented this. In America, many cities were going all the way to automobile uh, orientation. But in 1967, in San Francisco, and San Francisco is one of the cities which is always open-minded, rebellious, and very concerned about its own quality of life. And after construction of many, many freeways, uh, they were building also rapid transit for part system, but they also noticed that more and more freeways are being planned, and that a, a freeway, huge double deck, double level highway, is planned to go all along the coast to totally separate the city from the beautiful San Francisco Bay. And they started revolution, and we call it freeway revolt. That in many cities, people just said, just a minute, we don't want to live within a circle of a highway interchange. That's not the city we want. And they started that, and in the early 70s, most cities looked back into uh, the highway plans that they had. And many of them deleted many of those highways from their plans. My Philadelphia eliminated several highways which would have cut the city in many directions and made it more like Los Angeles or Detroit. So this was a very significant change and cities like Philadelphia which were slow in constructing were in better position than those that were really building many highways through their areas. The city of Los Angeles, which is famous by its automobile orientation, is now desperately trying to build better public transportation. And we have had a number of cities which have, first of all, stopped excessive freeways, and then turned also back to the city and made the center city more attractive and more livable. Good examples are the cities which made major projects in public transportation. Light rail transit has been particularly successful uh, that in many cities they introduced light rail and at the same time improved the entire corridors of the cities so that their mayors are now telling other cities that this project of light rail and coordination of light rail with the bus and with the car parking and so on did not only improve transportation but really changed the character of the entire city. Now, some of you who have been in France or in Spain France also does that very comprehensively. France, which didn't have very good tramways or rail, except for Paris, Lyon, Marseille, they didn't have much. Since 1970s, they began to build many, especially uh, light rail and tramway uh, lines, and improving all modes of transport or public transport, and they really redesigned the entire cities. And they put much more attention to pedestrians in center city. Reaction of people? A reaction is that our, in the United States, our center city has been losing population. Now it has turned around and it is increasing population in center city. To some extent, the mood of population also grows to various bases. 
somehow with the automobile and with uh, uh, the, the boom of babies after World War II, it seemed that the ideal in America is to have your own house as far from everybody as you can. Privacy is, was a big thing. Privacy, which I'm not sure if you have in Russian that word. Many languages don't have the word privacy. But the British and Americans love privacy. Now, they're discovering that it's nice to be social also. And really, younger people are coming. We have a change in that attitude, and it has an impact on transportation. <coughs> OK, next. Um, The, uh, the uh, public transport, provision of public transport, has had problems in many countries with financing and organization. And uh, some countries are subsidizing liberally, want to have good public transport, but inefficiencies are sometimes increasing if there is no careful uh, control of expenses and so on. So, in uh, Great Britain, the conservative government of Margaret Thatcher came and they developed a report by some extremely marketing-oriented economists who said that public transport, the way it is now, is that we have fewer and fewer bus riders and higher and higher costs. So it's less and less efficient. That is, that was a fact, that was true. What they did not mention was the British government did not support public transportation at all. Except for London, they didn't allow any rail transit construction in other cities. Buses were slow and not given preferential treatment and so on. They had no concept of what kind of city they want. But there was also an ideological element there. The very right-wing oriented government came, which simply said, we should apply free market. Now, I take a little bit simplistic way when I say that those who claim that everything should be in free market are as naive and as extreme as Marx when he denied free market and said everything should be dictated. Both extremes are naive, impractical, and have cost us a lot. So this, you know, when you go and study economics and so on, you know exactly that free market is fantastic for many things. Competition is very important for efficiency. Competition provides new products in all of this. However, not everything is for free market. Why? I don't have time to give you a course of three months, but free market does not include long-range view and long-range consequences. It's, in most cases, only short-term interest. If you have social benefits or social costs, Free market does not react to that. It does not include social considerations. Other externalities, what we call, such as the cultural aspects of the city, museums, radios, music, and so on, those are not provided in the free market. And public transport systems, what have we been doing through this development of public transit and improvements of public transit since the automobile came in? We learned, first of all, intermodal system must be coordinated between different modes. Second, we came in about 1960s or so in Europe. People said, just a minute, we're trying to get people to our transit system. 
you, people have a car, they can hop in the car and go to any place at any time. If we buy, if, we, if they use transit, they can use this bus, but then they cannot transfer to regional rail because they have another ticket and uh, because it's a different company and so on. So we have to integrate different modes. There was the concept of so-called transit federation, which many European cities introduced, and many American cities also uh, went strongly to that integration, that if you build a metro line, you must carefully plan how will people come to metro line, how will the buses come, light rail, park and ride, and so on. So we have been, we noticed that we have to provide for users to be ready to leave their cars and take our transit, we must provide an integrated system which connects well, synchronized as joint fares and so on. Now comes free market in England. They allow any company to provide public transportation with minimal control, even of safety and comfort and so on. Buses are competing in a wild way, and there is a legal prohibition that one bus company gives you information about other companies. That's unbelievable. We have professionally worked so hard to create a system that is good for the passengers and to, for the population. And here they're bringing a law telling us that we should be prohibited to think about passengers because the whole white book that they produce virtually does not mention the, the, the users, the passengers. In that case, you know, those are fanatics of minimum cost solutions which don't think about passengers and about the future of the city. I've read one book of some of these right-wing economists. They're talking about the future city, arguing that we are overpaying public transport, we should pay more for car. That book doesn't have in the index the word pedestrian, person, or transit user. It don't consider people, okay? So what happened with the uh, Thatcher they deregulated everything except London. They knew that London would fall apart with that. So London remained unified. But the rest of it got this, uh, uh, totally uh, destroyed as a system. And they lost over 30% of passengers from public transport. At the same time, they increased investments into their motorways. Now, what happened elsewhere? Yeah, I'm. I was shocked when I heard that some of your cities, or maybe your law, allows uncontrolled competition, uncoordinated competition to transit companies. That in some of your cities, regular trolley buses, buses, tramways, were heavily damaged by competition, unregulated. Well, I should tell you also that the first of this phenomenon, these phenomena, was in uh, 1916 in California. People bought cars and they began to go with these so-called jitneys, small buses, and they would know when the tramway comes. They come just before and steal the passengers and go. And the courts looked into that and they legally prohibited because you cannot do half regulation. We have one company that is regulated and responsive to public needs and operates to midnight reliably and comfortably and safely by some low-cost uh, uh, companies which are unregulated. In England they have uh, all kinds of problems of uh, untrained un uh, drivers and uh, uh, turnover of passengers and so, uh, of, of, uh, of drivers of the buses. Um, what happened in other countries? Well, to some way, in some way, many other countries said, England is right in this, that we have, we have relaxed some of the efficiency. We should ensure efficiency. And competition is a good element to that. So to shorten the story, but we now have, in different countries, like in Sweden, and in Germany, and, and in France, and so on, we have somewhat different organizations 
that various components of transit systems, say sets of bus companies here and there, and so on, uh, are tendered out, they are given a competitive basis, and they are controlled, and they are operated by different uh, owners, different operators, but based on the central plan which one agency of the city tells them, you operate this way, you operate this way, you have to coordinate, you have to have joint fares, you have to have such a such quality of service. So that is going on in many shapes in European countries and quite successful. Costs have been decreased, riders were not lost, the riders were increased. So you should check your situation and do not follow the British example in that respect. In some cases, again, you do have some minibuses that are useful and that are more economical and light routes than the large buses and so on. But if you do it, you again give it a coordinated way, you give the exact condition how that should be operated and integrate that in information, integrate in fares, so that the user has a unified system of high quality, continues to have a good system. You do not sacrifice the passengers in order to minimize your costs because the city falls apart and your costs and many other things increase. Now we sometimes have discussions about uh, trolleybus and uh, uh, tramway and, and bus. It's a very complex question which we could use hours to discuss but you do have to be careful that you do correct comparisons. We sometimes have, and this, this is what happened in the United States in the 1930s, they even all founded companies by bus manufacturers and, and uh, auto manufacturers and so on, and they bought tramway companies, and then they developed campaign against tramways, and they were comparing very old tramways, 50 years old tramways, with brand new buses. And that is not correct. You should not compare old with old tramway with new bus. You should compare old with old and new with new. So that is very important. And, uh, um, and the decisions of that are very important for the city. And uh, you do have Certainly, you need uh, not only excellent metro, but also the so-called medium capacity modes. And those of you who were yesterday, I elaborated on that quite a bit. I do not think that metro, metro is absolutely needed. You need more of metro. You need more of regional rail. But you also need better street transit, improved transit. You still understand you do not have any intersection where a bus or tramway will get green signal when it comes. It carries 100 people and it's treated like a vehicle which has one person. Now if you just think about that logic, how primitive we are that we give the same rights to a public transport vehicle or train with 100, 200 people, sometimes 500 people in a modern uh, light rail train the same as, as, as a private vehicle which carries less than two persons on the average. And you haven't started on that. You have to work also on that policy of favoring public transport and various ways of discouraging people from using cars. And if you discourage them, you better, be, you better offer them good uh, public transport. Uh, I should just mention this, that uh, with trolleybus and bus and tramway, bus is the cheapest to buy, but also has the shortest life, and it also has um, a very, very small infrastructure, and it is so-called flexible, and it's usually mentioned that flexible things are good. That is not the case in this situation, not flexible, but permanent 
uh, reliable transit is much higher quality than so-called flexible. In many projects on highways, the highways are widened or changed and so on. What about public transport? Well, buses can adjust. So there is a promise that you can do anything with buses. You don't include that in the project and very often you don't do anything about it. If you do that, then you are you are working against really the basic policies you should have in urban transportation. Uh, yeah, this tourniquetti uh, autobuses, autobuses, trolleybus, in tramway. They are uh, they certainly control pacing as well, but they are not efficient at all. And uh, if you develop better light rail transit and articulated bus or trolley bus, you will have to have a better way of boarding passengers because you cannot do that through that one door. It's a, it's a very impractical solution and I don't think it should be kept for the future. It should be really uh, replaced by many other methods of, of uh, collecting fares. Uh, now, the metro, I do have some comments, but I'm not sure uh, time. I would like to leave some time for questions. Now, let me just mention some, some uh, comments on metro that uh, your country adopted the policy in decades that when you reach one million, then you are qualified to get money from the federal government to uh, uh, build the metro. That is, uh, it's correct, I'm all for metros, but uh, it's, it's a very simple mechanical rule which is not always correct. You may have city smaller than a million that needs public transport, it's corridor and so on like Oslo and like many other cities in Europe. On the other hand, you may uh, have cities with up to 2 million, 3 million, where uh, light rail and, and good buses and so on may be sufficient. So that rule should be revised and particularly the problem is if, if the city reaches this and it builds only one line, a lot of money goes into that and the rest of the system is then neglected and you need more than one line in any city. You need many more lines and then you have, you have really alternatives, say either 11 kilometers of metro or for the same amount you could build 28 kilometers of tramways, modern light rail or trolley buses, maybe 35 kilometers or 50 kilometers of buses. So those are alternatives that should be evaluated. Uh, I'm suggesting that you should not build Globokolo, Zaluzhenia, that you don't have such long ways down and up. And some persons in, in the city government agree fully with me. That was an obsolete thing that was done for economic protection, which I think even at that time, was invalid because during World War II in London many people were in the tunnels and they were protected. But if you have atomic explosion, you still have to come out in a very sick situation. You did not escape it. Fortunately, I hope we are not ever going to have it. But you have to look, you have to look also what the passengers want, and if they have very long access, very long way down, very long way up, they're not likely to use metro for so many trips, only for longer trips, but not for shorter. So this quality, the, the how you treat passengers will also influence how many pa passengers are coming to public transport, how many are coming by private car. Uh, now this is something about uh, building the network of metro, I, I cannot go into that. So, this is the review of many developments that are happening here. You all agree, and I meet Russians here and Russians in other cities of the world, if I mention Moscow and transportation, oh, 
I hope they do something about this property and those situations that is there. Um, I hope that I've shown you how complex the problems are, uh, how many mistakes have been made. We also have faced these things you cannot charge for uh, on the streets. You cannot, you, we should not have high gas tax. In, in the United States, whoever is running for political office is promising reduction of gasoline tax, which is exactly opposite to what rational public policy should be. So uh, it's important that we do see the big picture and that we do see that it's, uh, that the city has to improve not only metro and regional rail, but also other transit modes and streets and parking and safety and so on. So we have very complex tasks, but we do have, uh, we should be using these and having discussions on these issues so that uh, the mistakes of other countries which have proven, been proven to be mistakes do not get repeated here. I thank you for your attention. Мы научный бойкнов, а мы просим сегодня задавать вопросы только на русском языке. Наши переводчики переведут, и, в общем, все, все поймут друг друга и услышат ответы и вопросы. У нас вот еще одна проблема, помимо того, что вы рассказали, это здесь присутствует. В частности, у нас на севере Москвы сейчас строятся, расширяются дороги преобразую в следующем виде это. То есть у нас получается обычная городская улица, четырехполосная, расширяется до десяти полос, при этом следующим образом. Шесть полос идет транзитные, по три полосы в каждую сторону движения, и по две боковые полосы. Фактически на городской улице образуются два вида транспорта – скоростной транзитный без светофорный и светофорный местный трафик. Насколько такие решения органичны для города, для жилого района? Прокомментируйте, пожалуйста. Um, the dilemmas exactly exist there. Your, many of your avenues need to be redesigned to be utilized better. However, um, you have to see, first of all, is, are those high-speed lanes, you don't mean transit lanes, you mean high-speed traffic lanes, right? Um, how, what's their impact on the surroundings? If it's a residential uh, area or a commercial area, then that can be, create serious problems. Um, the second one is, uh, is that a, like your Trecia uh, also, if, if it's a, the whole system that is an, a sort of freeway or a motorway, without intersections, then you have to maintain that. But if you have only one section without intersections, then you have to make sure that at the ends of this, what you do with traffic. Sometimes you may concentrate and direct a lot of traffic, but then at the end, you run into congestion. I think that your Tverskaya problem was increased when you widened some of the streets that were putting traffic into it. So it has to be that and another consideration. And the third consideration, if you are improving so much for highways, how are you treating transit? Are you including the major improvement in public transport? If not, 
and that is against these coordinated policies. So that those are the main things you should be looking at in, in deciding. On one side, you do want to use the area better, but how do you use it? How do you rebuild it? That's, those are the problems. Хорошо, вы говорили, что конкуренция между компаниями, которые занимаются транспортом, неэффективна и приводили ее в качестве отрицательного примера правительства Тэтчера. А можете еще раз объяснить, почему эта конкуренция неэффективна, что в ней плохого, почему транспортом должна заниматься одна компания? Um, it is inefficient because it destroys an integrated system as passengers want it. It's very simple. The service is offered. Now, uh, you, you stand on the street and there are five, five buses passing. If you take one, you have only one type of bus returning. Otherwise, you have to pay a different fare. To have you have totally independent fares. It's a situation becomes like 100 years ago. Totally wild competition which does not provide that service. I did not say that you must provide by one company. I emphasize that it can be different companies, but it must be, they must be fully coordinated. So you get efficiencies in operation and competition at that level, but you still provide an integrated service. Uh, from the passenger, for the passengers. And my main point is the, the goal in urban transport, in public transportation, is excellent service and service to the city, not minimizing the cost on cost efficiency. Yes, but that's not the, we should not do that at the cost of, uh, uh, of uh, making the system much less convenient for passengers. У нас в городе есть много мест, где трамвай как раз идет параллельно с обычной улицей, то есть не выделенной, а именно по центру. Сейчас кое-где стали реконструировать вот эти вот проблемы. Проблема в чем? Проблема в том, что после того, как добавляются две полосы трамвая, остальная улица до дальнейшего расширения встает в две полосы. И таким образом в пробке стоит ну, достаточно большое количество людей. Вопрос. Вот как лучше вообще э, такую реконструкцию начинать? Начинать с выделения трамвая в отдельную полосу или сначала добавить э, две полосы, чтобы не было бутылочного горлышка для автомобилей? Спасибо. Well, it depends on the situation, but uh, you, uh, if if the tramway is carrying a large volume of people, then you should provide it exclusive policy, exclusive track, independent of other traffic. If it's a, if it's moderate amount, they may share the lanes. Um, you go through the city systematically and see where you can separate lanes and provide that independence. The street traffic you also have to look at with advanced traffic engineering techniques. And in many cases, we have had sometimes a lot of propki because there is one narrow point. If you widen sometimes at intersections, you just add one more lane at the intersection. You increase capacity by 50%. So we have now in the United States strong movement about designing so-called complete streets. What is that? Well, that says that you have to consider auto traffic, public transport, trucks, pedestrians, everything. So you have to have the whole picture. And we have now many more sophisticated designs that work well. Uh, on, uh, 
on a tramway, you have uh, some sections which are separated, so-called uh, B type of separation, with some crossings and so on. Instead of increasing that, uh, you have opened it up for all of us. You've degraded tramway with the tramway every two minutes, and I've, I'm, I've seen it. Nobody told me. I've seen it. And then three cars are waiting for left turn, and tramway waits for five minutes. <laughs> That's the low point of coordination. You have to really uh, coordinate modes and make designs much better. Uh, like rail started like that in many cities, how can you do this, how can you improve that, and so on. And now you can, I could send it to many cities which have done remarkable things with low cost solutions and still very reliable rail services and minimum impact uh, on, on other traffic. I'll tell you, the city of Bergen in Norway, Bergen, a uh, rather small city, second city in uh, Norway, but about 350,000 or so. They just built a light rail line which has been built through some tunnels and in various solutions. Whenever, wherever that car comes to a signal, it gets green immediately. Passes, eight seconds later, other traffic goes. Everything works perfectly, really. So you can see it there in Bergen, they got the best award, the best light rail system. So there are problems, it's not always easy, but uh, uh, you should be doing much better. Your concept of the way tramway goes through the streets and so on is really from 1950s, where tracks are in bad condition. I've seen also tram comes and one can go through the signal and then, then it loses green and it's waiting for cars for another two minutes. That's not systems approach. Профессор, насколько я понимаю, вы достаточно хорошо знакомы с деятельностью департамента транспорта. Как вы могли бы прокомментировать последние действия последних полутора-двух лет? Если нет, то сотрудничаете ли вы с какими-либо консалтинговыми компаниями? What do you mean of the last two years? Я имею в виду, что московское правительство предпринимает значительные шаги и пытается ситуацию разрешить. Если вы с этими шагами знакомы, то как вы считаете правильное направление все это движется? Um, I have seen um, uh, considerable activities in discussing, in planning, in bringing new decisions in the right direction. I know that you have already improved their style on parking that was eliminated from the sidewalks. I know that uh, you're talking about buying, buying new tramways. Uh, I know that uh, Department of Transportation, but I, I've talked to Mr. Kusnulin, and I, I will talk again to Mr. Liksutov and so on. Uh, I will see more. My impression is that the city is very active.